Lucan's wife, Paula Argentaria, helped him revise his Pharsalia, a very famous classical poem. Well, not that famous anymore, but anyhow, just take my word for it. And that's my interjection, not in the source. And Fantasia of Memphis reputedly wrote an epic on Troy that inspired Homer. Dunn unfortunately died many centuries before the 1985 smash hit single Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves with the Eurythmics and Aretha Franklin, but I'm sure he would have endorsed it. This is Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature, with Michael Elliott. Welcome to Open Book, episode 14, How to Read John Donne's Poetry. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary, and today's topic is Seven Poems by John Donne, the 17th century preacher and poet, hailed for his metaphors as the monarch of wit. Some of those metaphors were quite striking and outlandish, of which the most famous is the flea, in which he uses a flea which has bitten him and his mistress to argue that they ought to sleep together. Think about it. But we're not reading Duns the Flea in this episode. We're reading seven other poems from Colin Burroughs' 2006 Penguin Anthology, Metaphysical Poetry. They are Elegy to His Mistress Going to Bed, The Good Morrow, The Sun Rising, Valediction to His Book, A Valediction Forbidding Morning, The Canonization, and The Relic. My readings are from the Penguin Anthology I mentioned. My supplemental notes, though, are mostly from the 1971 Penguin Complete English Poems of John Donne, edited by A.J. Smith, and also from Donald R. Dixon's John Donne's Poetry, published by Norton in 2007. So, without further ado, let's start at the beginning of that list and move sequentially. But there are so many commonalities among these poems that we will read them cumulatively. The order I've chosen for them is a bit arbitrary, but it moves broadly from the sensual poems, well, okay, sexual, really, to Dunn's more rarefied, elevated poems. Let's begin now with Elegy to His Mistress Going to Bed. The term elegy has two quite distinct meanings, so it's important to get them on the table first. An elegy is either a poem of lamentation, usually about the death of its subject, which is not what Dunn is writing here. The other definition of elegy is a classical poem whose meter alternates between lines of different lengths. One of the most famous elegists was the Roman poet Ovid, whose series of erotic elegies, the Amores, were Dunn's inspiration. But Dunn keeps the meter regular, opting instead for the more common English habit of rhyming couplets. The source of Elegy to His Mistress Going to Bed is one of Ovid's elegies from Amores on an afternoon tryst. Here's how it begins. Come, madam, come. All rest my powers defy, until I labor, I in labor lie. The foe, oft times having the foe in sight, is tired with standing, though they never fight. The second line here means, until I labor on you, that is, have sexual relations with you, I am tormented by anticipation. The military metaphor that he then uses refers to this standing foe, which is really the first of many references he is going to make to his erect member. Then he begins a long series of couplets in which he asks her directly to remove one garment after another. He begins on line five. 
Off with that girdle, like heaven's zone glistering, but a far fairer world encompassing. Unpin that spangled breastplate which you wear, that the eyes of busy fools may be stopped there. Unlace yourself, for that harmonious chime tells me from you that now tis your bedtime. Off with that happy busk whom I envy that still can be and still can stand so nigh. Your gown's going off. Such beauty a state reveals as when from flowery meads the hill's shadow steals. Off with your wiry coronet and show the hairy diadem which on you doth grow. Now off with those shoes and then safely tread in this love's hallowed temple, this soft bed. There are quite a few terms here that you ought to look up. Here's one that I'll give you. The spangled breastplate refers to something called a stomacher, which is an ornamental jeweled garment worn around a woman's torso underneath of her bodice, which covered her chest. The uh, busk, for example, is a, is a corset. A uh, coronet is a metal headband. In line 19, Don continues talking about her garments and removing them. In such white robes, heaven's angels used to be received by men. Thou, angel, bringst with thee a heaven like Mohammed's paradise. And though ill spirits walk in white, we easily know by this these angels from an evil sprite. They set our hairs, but these, the flesh, upright. We've seen that reference to his erection before. The heaven like Muhammad's paradise, by the way, is a reference to the Quranic descriptions of paradise as a sensual kind of afterlife. By the time line 25 comes along, Dunn is no longer watching and encouraging her to disrobe, but actively participating. He can't keep his hands to himself. He says, license my roving hands and let them go behind, before, above, between, below. Oh, my America, my newfound land, my kingdom, safeliest when with one man manned, my mine of precious stones, my empery, how blessed am I in this discovering thee. All of these references to overseas expansion and exploitation and discovery. Discovery, uh, by the way, is, has a pun. He's dis covering her. He then uses a reference to the way that people would write letters and seal them to be sent in line 31. To enter in these bonds is to be free. Then where my hand is set, my seal shall be. Hand means his, his hand writing, which is going to be sealed inside of a letter, which was commonly closed up with a, a waxen pool, which you would then impress your, your signet ring into, or some other seal. Let's resume at line 33. Full nakedness, all joys are due to thee. As souls unbodied, bodies unclothed must be to taste whole joys. Gems which you women use are as Atlanta's balls cast in men's views. By the way, Atlanta was distracted from a foot race by some golden apples. So Atlanta's balls means distractions from in men's views. Continuing on, that when a fool's eye lighteth on a gem, his earthly soul may covet theirs, not them. Like pictures, or like books' gay coverings made for laymen, are all women thus arrayed. Themselves are mystic books, which only we, whom their imputed grace will dignify, must see revealed. Then, since I may know, as liberally as to a midwife, show thyself, cast all, yea, this white linen hence, 
There is no penance, much less innocence. To teach thee, I am naked first. Why then, what needst thou have more covering than a man? That closing line means something like, more covering than a man has, i.e. no covering at all, or it means to be covered with a man, i.e. himself. This is really one of Donne's most sexually explicit poems. But it's not as though he is only just writing sort of erotic boudoir literature. He's also following these classical sources. He's trying to write a Novidian elegy, at least in style. But there are also a lot of features of this poem that we'll see in the ones that we'll read next. There are references to the cosmos, references to books and pictures, references to the overseas expansion of the globe, or rather of Englishmen's knowledge thereof. And his tone is also characteristic. It's dominating. It's really very domineering. It's seeking to set the terms of their relationship in ways that are, let it be said, quite favorable to his sexual gratification. Yet also, amid all this directness, it's also seeking to elevate it to a higher sphere. Next, we'll turn to The Good Morrow, a morning after poem in which the poet speaks about how he and his lover are awakening to a new life together. I wonder by my troth what thou and I did till we loved. Were we not weaned till then, but sucked on country pleasures childishly? Or snorted we in the seven sleepers' den? Twas so. But this, all pleasures, fancies be. If ever any beauty I did see which I desired and got, twas but a dream of thee. A couple of references really need explaining here. The reference to sucking on country pleasures is a reference to the noble infants of 17th century aristocratic families who were wet-nursed in the country. Whereas the Seven Sleepers Den... Oh, I'm sorry, the country pleasures... Well, it sort of means something like either a rustic sexual pleasure for its own gratification, which is not really about building fidelity to another person. The the Seven Sleepers Den is an odd reference to these Christian youths who were entombed in a cave for literally 187 years and miraculously woke up and walked out of the cave. In In the latter half of this opening stanza, we see the sort of connection between the fancies and the dream that all of these preceding events, all of these past experiences, till we love, that is before we loved each other, were just dreams. These other pleasures were just fancies uh, of what they would find together. Let's look at stanza two. And now... Good morrow to our waking souls, which watch not one another out of fear, for love, all love of other sights controls, and makes one little room and everywhere. Let sea discoverers to new worlds have gone, let maps to others worlds on worlds have shown, let us possess one world. Each hath one and is one. We've seen already in To His Mistress Going to Bed the way that he describes her body as a world that he, the the discoverer, the exploring discoverer, is going to ravage or exploit. 
But here we see the way that they themselves are a world unto each other. They are actually, they hath one, and they are one, which is contradictory, of course. They can't both be true, and yet they are both true. They are two halves of one, as they will, as, he, as we'll see in the next stanza. My face in thine eye, thine in mine, appears, and true plain hearts do in the faces rest. That is to say, they can see each other's faces reflected back to themselves in the other's irises. Where can we find two better hemispheres without sharp north, without declining west? These lines mean that they are two halves of one sphere, which are better than the real hemispheres of the globe because they don't have the sharp north, that is, the, the, the bitter bleakness of the north, and the declining west, the falling off, the, these sort of lapses of human attachments. They are free. Line 19, let's continue. Whatever dies was not mixed equally. If our two loves be one, both thou and I love so alike that none do slacken, none can die. There's a theory in medicine of this time that if you don't have equal mixes of the different constituent elements that make up your body, sometimes called the humors of your body, that you will die as a result, that all disease derives from an imbalance of those unequal mixtures. And they cannot die because they are unalterable. They are not subject to decline. The Sun Rising is another poem about the morning experience of the lovers, which is a direct address to the sun, but not in the ways that poets typically address the sun. Typically they write something, the form is known as an obad, A-U-B-A-D-E, which is a sort of tribute to the beauty and vitality etc. of the sun. Well, in this case, Dunn wishes to, unsurprisingly, speak in terms that uh, will put himself and his lover in far more favorable terms than the sun has. Busy old fool, unruly sun, why doth thou thus through cur windows and through curtains call on us? Must to thy motions, lover's seasons run? Saucy, pedantic wretch. Go chide late schoolboys and sour prentices. Go tell court huntsmen that the king will ride. Call country ants to harvest offices. Love all alike, no season knows, nor clime, nor hours, days, months, which are the rags of time. The speaker here is pretty obviously contemptuous of the sun's typical powers. It tells it to go away and tell country ants or farmers to that they need to go do their harvest duties. And their love is free from time, free from these, these rags uh, in line 10, which really means sort of fragments or, or, or scraps of time. Those are mere tiny little bits of time. The love that they have is timeless. It doesn't know these kinds of undulations, these periodic changes. Let's look at the second stanza. Thy beams so reverend and strong, why shouldst thou think? I could eclipse and cloud them with a wink, but that I would not lose her sight so long. If her eyes have not blinded thine, Look, and tomorrow late, tell me whether both the Indias of spice and mine be where thou left them, or lie here with me. Ask for those kings whom thou sawst yesterday, and thou shalt hear, all here in one bed lay. 
Dunn's meaning here is that everything grand and beautiful and prodigious that's in the world, the, the Indias in line 17, uh, the East Indies of spice, the West Indies of gold and other mines, are not greater than the riches of his mistress, the, the kings that... And their, and their grand courts that the sun sees in its daily course around the globe are all, all surpassed, all contained by the marvels of his mistress. It gets even better in the last stanza. She is all states, and all princes I. Nothing else is. Princes do but play us. Compared to this, all honors mimic, all wealth, alchemy. Thou, son, art half as happy as we, in that the world's contracted thus. Thine age asks ease, and since thy duties be to warm the world, that's done in warming us. Shine here to us, and thou art everywhere. This bed thy center is, these walls thy sphere. The Indias and the kings now have been contracted thus into the world that they represent. They, not only do they surpass it, they themselves surpass the world, but the treasures and the glories and the riches uh, of the world are merely pale imitations of them, like alchemical gold is to real gold. The line about the sun's age asking ease or means that it deserves ease because according to the biblical version of creation, the sun is more than 5,000 years old and really deserves a rest. The sun is also a symbol of, of life, of 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 energy, of sexual vigor, etc. And to them, it has found its epitome in the lovers. The next two poems are both called valediction, which means a farewell speech. Vale being farewell in Latin and diction being speech. And Don writes both of them when he needs to take leave of his beloved. In Valediction to his book, the longer and more complex of the two, he echoes ideas that we will see in the relic, which we'll come to in a few minutes, in which their words and letters become almost sacred texts. Not almost. They become sacred texts for interpreting the the god of love. Let's begin. I'll tell thee now, dear love, what thou shalt do to anger destiny as she doth us, how I shall stay, though she alloin me thus, and how posterity shall know it, too. I will just pause there to say that if you know the meaning of the word eloin in line three, congratulations. If you don't, underline it and look it up. Continuing on, he says, How thine may outendure Sibyl's glory, and obscure her who from Pindar could allure, and her through whose help Lucan is not lame, and her whose book they say Homer did find and name. A couple, well, okay, a lot of references here that need some explanation. I'm going to read to you directly from Donald Dixon's notes in John Donne's poetry, the Norton collection that I've mentioned at the beginning. Dixon writes, all these women helped a man achieve something great. The Sibyl at Cume aided Aeneas in his descent to the underworld. Corinna taught Pindar how to write and bested him in poetic contests. Lucan's wife, Paula Argentaria, helped him revise his Pharsalia, a very famous classical poem. Well, not that famous anymore, but anyhow, just take my word for it. And that's my interjection, not in the source. 
And Fantasia of Memphis reputedly wrote an epic on Troy that inspired Homer. Dunn unfortunately died many centuries before the 1985 smash hit single Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves with the Eurythmics and Aretha Franklin, but I'm sure he would have endorsed it. Continuing on with stanza two, study our manuscripts, those myriads of letters which have passed twixt thee and me. Thence write our annals. That's a word to look up. And in them will be to all whom love's subliming fire invades, rule and example found. There, the faith of any ground, no schismatic will dare to wound, that sees how love this grace to us affords, to make, to keep, to use, to be these his records. Love's subliming fire in line 13 means it's purifying fire, and those who feel it can find rule and example, that is, precedents and models to live by. The following lines mean, effectively, that uh, none will doubt their beliefs of our clear authority. Records, by the way, also means witnesses. This book, as long lived as the elements, or as the world's form, this all-graved tome in cipher writ, or new-made idiom, we for love's clergy only are instruments, when this book is made thus... Should again the ravenous vandals and goths inundate us, learning we're safe. In this our universe, schools might learn sciences, spheres music, angels verse. There's a lot going on in this stanza. So to give you a few glosses, the elements that create the world are the sort of chaotic elements that will be assembled and arranged into the world that gets created by by God. The all-graved tome, the tome means book, all-graved means an engraved, like i.e. an enduring tome. Cipher means a code or a new-made idiom, like a new form of language. As we can see in the next line, 22, they are the, the means of understanding love, capital L, love itself. And at the end of the stanza, we can see the kinds of people that should learning be destroyed by these invading armies, these invading tribes, rather, that they will keep learning safe. Scholars will learn their disciplines. The, the cosmic spheres will learn their harmonious music. And the angels who represent perfect poetry will learn their poetic forms again. The next three stanzas all refer back to this book. They all start with the word here, here in this book. Here, love's divines, since all divinity is love or wonder, may find all they seek, whether abstract spiritual love they like, their souls exhaled with what they do not see, or loath so to amuse faith's infirmity, they choose something which they may see and use. For though mind be the heaven where love doth sit, beauty, a convenient type, may be to figure it. The closing stanza means effectively that although the mind may have this platonic ideal or idea of love, the beauty of things in the world is a figuration or an embodiment of that divine essence. In the next stanza, we move from love's divines to lawyers. Here, more than in their books, may lawyers find, both by what titles mistresses are ours, and how prerogative the estates devours, transferred from love himself to womankind, who, though from heart and eyes they exact great subsidies, forsake him who on them relies and for the cause, honor, or conscience give chimeras vain as they, or their prerogative. The first half of this stanza means that although men have claims on women, women claim exemptions from that rule because they are 
possessions only of love. And as for the latter half of this stanza, I'm going to read to you from A.J. Smith's notes in the Penguin edition, page 409. He writes, Women evade men's rightful claim on them by usurping the arbitrary powers of exemption, which really belong only to love himself. And in the next stanza, Dunn turns to the third category of people who can learn from them. Here, statesmen, or of them they which can read, may of their occupation find the grounds, love and their art alike its deadly wounds, if to consider what tis one proceed. And by this, Dunn means that by trying to, to reckon it, to, to measure it, you actually ruin it. You, 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 it really requires blind adherence. In both, they do excel who the present govern well, whose weakness none doth or dares tell. In this thy book, such will there nothing see, as in the Bible some can find out alchemy. The second last line means that they can see their nothingness in comparison to us. And the last line means that those who are looking for codes in Scripture are like spiritual alchemists. They're looking for something in vain. Let's look at the last stanza now. Thus vent thy thoughts. Abroad I'll study thee, as he removes far off that great heights takes. How great love is, presence, best trial makes, but absence tries how long this love will be. To take a latitude... Sun or stars are fitliest viewed at their brightest, but to conclude of longitudes, what other way have we but to mark when and where the dark eclipses be? This is a lovely summation of the whole poem in which, as I said, he is taking his leave of her, hence the emphasis on, on absence, and then tries, that is, it proves or demonstrates how long this love will be. And then, as he is about to travel, he uses these geographical references. A latitude, which is to say the measurement of how far north or south you are, is measured with constellations. But longitude, which was... a uh, vexing problem for east-west navigation, particularly, obviously, to the New World, is only something you can calculate through the timing of eclipses by the durations of eclipses. And by eclipses in the last line, he here means their separations. So we can also see that just as he referred to the sun shining here and having all of its essence in this one place, here their absence also sort of equates with a, an eclipse. It, it, he's, he's using very cosmic terms to uh, describe their love. Let's turn now to a valediction forbidding mourning, which is a really very similarly themed or rather, similarly occasioned poem. It's about the same sort of event. It is about the same event. He is parting from her. Partly, by the way, this is just a conventional subject for poetry, but it is also possible, probable even, that uh, when Dunn went traveling away from his wife, particularly on one trip in 1611 when he traveled to France, he was actually writing this given a particular occasion in their marriage. In this case, he, as the title suggests, forbids her to mourn his absence. As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, whilst some of their sad friends do say the breath goes now, and some say no, so let us melt and make no noise, no tear floods, nor sigh tempests move. Twere profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. Moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Men reckon what it did and meant, but 
trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. Dull, sublunary lover's love, whose soul is sense, cannot admit absence, because it doth remove those things which elemented it. But we, by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is, interassured of the mind, careless eyes, lips, and hands to miss, our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. If they be two, they are two so as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. And though it in the centre sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it, and grows erect as that comes home. Such wilt thou be to me, who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Thy firmness makes my circle just, and makes me end where I begun. I will confess to you that this is my favourite John Donne poem. Partly because it's the most familiar of the poems, it's the one that I read first, and partly also because, because it begins with this, this supreme assurance of the, of the rarity, the, the, the perfection, the elevation of their love over what he calls dull sublunary lover's love. That is a lovely alliteration, firstly. But sublunary means literally beneath the moon. And some things that are, things that are below the moon are, well, say, like the tides. They're inconstant. They're in flux. They're always in motion. So the love of those sublunary lovers is elemented, that is, substantiated by presence, by things like eyes, lips, and hands. But we, he says, have a more refined love, a love that is between souls, not bodies. And so he begins then to have his first kind of glancing, very momentary simile, like gold to airy thinness beat, that is gold that is pounded out into foil or leaf. But then he begins this extended simile, this extended metaphysical conceit, that is to say a very kind of an outlandish uh, kind of unexpected metaphor when he refers to or describes rather their two souls as the two legs of a compass. And for this, by the way, you have to imagine a compass, not like something that has a magnetic dial that swirls around, but the two legs of a metallic instrument often used for say navigation uh, in which you you point one foot in and swing the other in a circle around it that's why his foot obliquely runs in the last stanza that means it runs in a curve not in a straight line and his circle returns all the way back to her in the end that's why her firmness which her her steadiness her her fixity makes his circle just which echoes in a way the spheres that he mentions in line 11 which are themselves sort of an echo of the cosmic spheres that are going to learn music these are these vast hollow globes that are that are moving round the earth at the edge of the observable universe on which the fixed stars are held and move i mentioned at the top of this podcast that dunn was both a preacher a sermon writer and a poet he's really frankly much better known uh, for 
his poetry today than his sermons, but his sermons also are extraordinarily complex and beautiful and extensive. Well, in the final two poems of today's episode, we're going to look at the way that Dunn's religious beliefs, particularly his anti-Catholic beliefs, take poetic form. And yet it's not as simple as calling them anti-Catholic because Dunn, having been born himself into a Catholic family, has a nuanced and ambivalent set of religious beliefs. In the canonization, he imagines himself and his beloved becoming saints. It's not that far, really, from them having been the rule and example, the epitome of love that others will learn it by. Anyway, let's read the canonization. For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. Or chide my palsy or my gout, my five gray hairs or ruined fortune flout. With wealth, your state, your mind with arts improve. Take you a course, get you a place. Observe his honor or his grace or the king's real or his stamped face. Contemplate what you will. Approve, so you will let me love. The first couple of lines here are about his age and decrepitude compared to her beauty. And what follows are the courtly, worldly things that she might seek, say, as a, the king's reel or a stamped face, for example, either as a favor-seeking courtier or a stamped face on a coin, someone who seeks wealth. These are realms from which he excludes himself. Alas, alas, he asks, who's injured by my love? What merchant's ships have my sighs drowned? Who says my tears have overflowed his ground? When did my colds a forward spring remove? When did the heats which my veins fill add one more to the plaguey bill? Soldiers find wars, and lawyers find out still litigious men which quarrels move though she and I do love. The gist of this stanza is that their love is harmless to all of these other events and people and concerns of the world. The sighs, tears, colds, and heats are all these kind of cliched Petrarchan love suffering, love ailments and that are, that are in fact quite harmless. They don't add any negativity to the world. When did the heats which my veins feel add one more to the plaguey bill? That needs a bit of explanation. Those are the, the bill is the sort of the daily lists of those who die from the plague. Well, this is not actually a thing that he has affected or changed with his internal heat. Call us what you will, we are made such by love. Call her one, me, another fly. We are tapers, too, and at our own cost die. And we in us find the eagle and the dove. The phoenix riddle hath more wit by us. We two, being one, are it. So to one neutral thing both sexes fit. We die and rise the same and prove mysterious by this love. There's an eager, frenetic piling up of comparisons. Call us what you will. All these things. Uh, they are flies. They are, they are tapers, which are candles, which, are, which die at their own cost. This whole thing about dying, by the way, re recurs in the uh, penultimate line. And dying is uh, a, a reference to sexual activity which they, it self-consumes them like, like candles or, or perhaps like, like moths or flies that, that are consumed by the flame. And then he lists these, these birds, the eagles, this masculine strength, the dove is this, this, uh, this gentle, this feminine gentleness. The phoenix, of course, is the, uh, the self-immolating, regenerating bird that 
they embody, that they make from a myth to a reality. And we die and rise the same means they expend and renew this energy. And mysterious means saint-like. We can die by it, if not live by love. And if unfit for tombs and hearse our legend be, it will be fit for verse. And if no piece of chronicle we prove, we'll build in sonnets pretty rooms. As well, a well-wrought urn becomes the greatest ashes as half-acre tombs. And by these hymns, all shall approve us canonized for love. He's saying here in a number of different uh, metaphors, or, or rather comparisons, that they are sufficiently satisfied with the smaller genres, the smaller sizes of things. Uh, for example, uh, what do we have here? Verse versus tombs and hearse. The verse is quite small and, and local, uh, like a sonnet, for example. They don't need a chronicle, which is this vast collection of events, this last vast, often historical account. They just need this 14-line little tiny little song. And a well-wrought urn, which is a funeral urn where you put the ashes into it, it's fine, just as adequate as this vast half-acre tomb. They will be, as he says, turned into saints. Mysterious by this love, I already mentioned, canonized means turned into saints, and thus invoke us. Now he's speaking, by the way, to their future admirers, their, the, the people who will idealize them in the future. Thus invoke us, you whom reverend love made one another's hermitage, you to whom love was peace that now is rage, who did the whole world's soul extract and drove into the glasses of your eyes, so made such mirrors and such spies that they did all to you epitomize, countries, towns, courts, beg from above a pattern of your love. So those admirers who address you, that is us, the speaker and his beloved, they recognize that what was peaceful is now rage. That either means that it is now frustration, it's some debased version of, of their, their harmony, or maybe it's that they are now rage in the more positive sense of heavenly ecstasy. It's a little unclear. The whole world soul is now compressed into their eyes. That is... The word epitomize means a, a summary, that means a, or rather it's the verb to summarize, but in such a way that you are creating a superior distillation of something that, that has all of its perfections compressed into it. Beg from above a pattern of your love that is the model, the example of love. And they are, just like in the sun rising, this bed thy center is, these walls thy sphere, they are at the center of epitomizing all manner of things in the entire universe simply through the power of their love. All right, now, the relic is a little bit more hmm, ambivalent, shall we say, about their future misinterpretation. Let's read it. When my grave is broke up again, some second guess to entertain? For graves have learned that woman head to be to more than one a bed. And he that digs it spies a bracelet of bright hair about the bone. Will he not let us alone and think that there a loving couple lies, who thought that this device might be some way to make their souls, at the last busy day, meet at this grave and make a little stay. The bracelet of bright hair is a, to us, unusual token of love. A beloved would give to her lover uh, her bracelet, or her, ha her hair rather, uh, braided together as uh, for him to wear. This device, though, 
is what he means in, in the, the bracelet in, in line nine, is a way that at the last busy day, that is the day of resurrection, when all the souls have to go about gathering up the bits and pieces of their, their mortal being, they will meet together. She will need, in other words, to gather up this this relic of herself, or this 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 bracelet, and so their souls may meet at his grave because there's his body. If this fall in a time or land when misdevotion doth command, and I'll just break off there to say misdevotion means Catholic devotion, Catholic belief systems then he that digs us up will bring us to the bishop and the king to make us relics. Then thou shalt be a Mary Magdalene, and I a something else thereby. All women shall adore us, and some men. And since at such times miracles are sought, I would have that age by this paper taught what miracles we harmless lovers wrought. A relic is a precious object, made precious, that is, by its association with someone who becomes a saint. So the connection here with their, the canonization is pretty obvious. Uh, miracles are, of course, the other things that saints are capable of doing. That's what makes them saintly. But we are, in fact, just harmless lovers, blameless lovers. And this paper is this poem. He wants this poem to correct that, uh, that, that impulse. In other words, to, to check, to, to redirect, to prevent this misdevotion, this misinterpretation of what they've been. And this is how it will do so with the next stanza. First, we loved well and faithfully yet knew not what we loved or why, difference of sex no more we knew than our guardian angels do. And that's because the angels are, are famously uh, genderless. They have, no, they have no difference of sex. Coming and going, we perchance might kiss, but not between those meals. Our hands ne'er touch the seals which nature injured by late law sets free. These miracles we did, but now, alas, all measure and all language I should pass, should I tell what a miracle she was. The line about uh, their hands never touching the seals which nature, injured by late law, sets free, refers to, effectively means they have not had sexual relationships. They, the hands and the seals, by the way, is uh, an echo of the line 32 into his mistress going to bed, in which he says, then where my hand is set, my seal shall be. Nature sets free the sexual activity that is natural, but it's only injured by late law. It's really only because of the fall that sexuality is seen as, as sinful. He finally then repeats and reinterprets the word miracle to say that she surpasses them. Well, in fact, he's kind of, as he says, all measure and all language I should surpass. The word measure literally has about 19 different definitions in the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, it means things like a course of action. It means a guaranteed portion. But the two that matter here are all measure, like the measurement of meter in poetry, but also all restraint, all moderation, I should pass if I were to do justice to her miraculous being and our love. And so, seven poems later, we come to the end of this episode of Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. Our next episode is the first in a three-part series on Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash Elliott. 
You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email, Elliot at UCalgary, that's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka. Mm-hmm.